great. Josh, I'll take this one. Yeah. Okay, you go take a nap. <laughs> so how are you guys doing today, man? We're doing great, thank yeah. you. Great. So where are you all from? Uh, I write for Cloture Club, and we're like a DC-based website. Um, you want me to put that here, or do you need that to be here? She needs it. I got it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Bring it in. Get all the technology. Uh, I'm Travis. I'm from uh, Punch Up Critics and Examiner.com. Great. I'm Dean Rogers. I'm with The Rogers Review. Out of now College Park, where I just moved recently. Oh, nice. great. That's good. Well, hello, guys. Well, I'm glad you guys could join us, man, uh, to talk about this. Uh, there are a lot of Steve Jobs movies kind of going around right now. It's really popular. Um, it seems that when there's like one biopic about an individual, there are like ten, I just read that there are literally three or four competing Lance Armstrong biopics being yes, involved right yes, now. It's are. a fascinating thing where it's like... People are just like, oh, that's a fascinating figure. Well, I mean, Let's it, make ten movies about him. But well, they're, they're, it's, it's because you know, there's no. I mean, we always joke that there are no new ideas, but when it comes to like somebody's life, everybody. Wants it's it. it's true, but it's also interesting because people don't have the same criticism for books. Right. You know, you will find at least it's twenty true. different books on Steve Jobs. Right. Nobody will criticize that because it's not a visual medium. And I and I think that the same thing should be applied. You know, there are two Capote movies, for instance, mm -hmm. both very interesting, both detailing a completely different facet of his life. There were two Dillinger movies. Two Dillinger well. movies. There have been like eight different movies about you know I don't know, certain individuals that you're just like okay. But um, there's also a theory I was told when I was just starting out that that was a little more crazy and and spiritual in that that said that the second you think it it's in the zeitgeist if you have an idea it becomes it goes out there goes sure. out the and that it doesn't matter whether it's about a person if it's the story of so make it because it will be made and I to be honest it, the amount of times I've thought this is such a great idea and it's not that the idea was already done it's the idea is getting done and when did it get bought as a scrap you know as a spec sale or as, as a spec or as a sale it was bought like a month ago and then it's just you, you can't even let people wouldn't believe you that you just had that idea I forget what the name of that concept was that as soon as you think something it like travels it manifests like, yes. other parts of the world I forget what the like the real the secret stop thing. thinking for yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, going, but going back to that though I mean like we were saying there are all these Steve Jobs biopics. They all seem to be exploring different aspects of him. So, what aspect? What was it about him that made you want to tell this particular story? Well, to me, this is really an origin story. This is from the time he's in his college days, just to his late thirties, right before the iMac. You know, the iMac being that sort of Bondi blue translucent pod-like computer that came to define him. Most people think the beginning of Mac begins with that, because from there came the iPod and everything else that became the history as we know it. But the struggle that he went through, the inner demons he had to overcome, the judgment, the sort of misunderstandings people had of him, his being this sort of hippie character in a very corporate IBM world that never really quite accepted him. And, you know, a man who had a vision, but then what's the business of vision? How can you create something into existence that doesn't exist when you have a board of directors that are risk adverse? So it, it's in contrary to being a visionary is, is taking, you know, visionary is taking risk by definition because you're doing something people haven't done. So that was what was interesting to me about this. And it was about the man Steve Jobs and about Apple and how at one point they became one where the company became him and he could not be connected and everything that existed in his life before that company kind of fell away because there was no room in it but for him and his company. So, so I'd like to think of it as a prequel to what everybody already knows. It's like a prequel to the universal, um, to the universal knowledge and, and history that we seem to have of Steve Jobs because my history of Steve Jobs is very different than this movie. It begins post-1999 right. with the introduction of a device called the iPod to me where somebody showed it to me and, and I had played around with these barbaric kind of early MP3 players and none of it made sense. I was much more content 
on my little uh, Walkman than I was using any of these devices. And all of a sudden I see this thing with this ring in the middle of it and it, it could store all these songs and it was so simple. And then they said, well, you want to make your life even simpler? And they showed me a Mac and how easily integrated all of this could be. And, and then they said, you want to make your life even more simple? Here's a phone. And then it just, it, it, you know, it became this thing. And I, and I think that for my generation, that's what defines Steve Jobs, that and Pixar. This other stuff... It was all brand new to me. When I came on board this project, you know, I had known Pirates of Silicon Valley I saw a long time ago and things like that. But I wasn't really aware of the prequel of sorts right. to what everybody knows about the cult of jobs. It's an origin story. It is an origin story. Well, touching along the lines to Josh, what brought you onto the project? And to the other Josh, what brought you onto the project? <clears throat> I was um, I was just coming off of Book of Mormon and I was looking for some uh, challenging projects that I felt like I could you know in Hollywood it's very easy to become pigeonholed into a certain archetype uh, and I was looking to kind of break that trend and, and I wanted to try things that were a little bit more challenging and not just the same role over and over again. Josh and I had met and um, you know I was immediately taken by the challenge of playing a living, breathing human being who everybody has an opinion on uh, in, in, in the was. Uh, he's a part of the pop culture lexicon at this point, whether your knowledge is limited to Dancing with the Stars or to, you know, his, um, his contribution to one of, one of the greatest um, inventions in, in computer technology history. So, for me, it was about that challenge and Josh... I guess saw footage from my movie Thanks for Sharing, uh, which is coming out soon, and, and he had said, okay, you know, I've seen enough to know that this guy can do the dramatic thing as well, I, I think. Yeah, that's how I came to Josh. As, as far as me coming to the project, you know, it was started off by some outsiders in Texas who had some money and had, had a script written outside of the Hollywood system, completely um, autonomous, wanted to so I had seen my second film, uh, Swing Vote, and I flew out to meet them, and I just couldn't resist it. I, there was just something compelling about how scary this was. And I always think that if you're very afraid of something, you should do it. Because if you're going to fail, you'll fail big. And if you succeed, that will be great, you know. And so I worked with them to bring it into Hollywood. And anyway, I took it to Ashton through my through the agency. And um, he already had been channeling Steve Jobs when he heard that there was a script about him out there. Uh, because he had been sort of fascinated with Steve himself, and he's a techie, you know, real into the tech technology world. And he came to the first meeting already being Steve. I mean, he was already had his mannerisms, and, and you know, so I left the meeting feeling like, wow, there's something here, and this guy's going to work so hard, and he's already done so much research, and he gets the guy, he understands what drives him, because he deals with these people every day, these people with these apps that are totally obsessed with the one thing that's going to change the world, he knows this, and so I also thought it was a provocative choice, because I knew there'd be skepticism about it, and I also thought that was interesting for this role, and that there's something electric about this this character and this actor, there was something that was curious and provocative that I think would help the, the sort of the footprint of the film in an otherwise crowded field with so much tentpole Hollywood movies. How does a small little drama break through? Because that's all what this is. It's a little human drama, even though it is about a big guy. It's, that's all it really is. So that was, that's, and Josh, I just saw his performance in this movie and I thought it was remarkable and I, I always forget that he was just finishing his play when he literally finished and came onto this I think what didn't you I mean it was yeah. it was a huge he did not have that breather moment where he's sitting in New York for three months wondering what he he's just he's taking off and and I'm just really uh, sort of honored that I was his first step up to the uh, diving board that he'll be <laughs> um on the uh, casting note, I thought it was so cool at the end with the pictures, where I, it was the characters looked pretty much identical to the people in real life. I thought that was really interesting. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting the way that Ashley even tried to walk like Steve Jobs. And I was wondering if there were any quirks with Waz that you tried to incorporate that you noticed in like videos and you know, Abs you know dancing prowess. Absolutely. And so. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, I think we were all. I think we all felt an enormous responsibility um, because 
you know, I, I like to compare it to Spielberg's Lincoln. There isn't that visual and oral history of what those people sounded like. There are some pictures that are grainy and old, but you get to use a lot, you get to fill in a lot of blanks. People will call me on my fucking bluff if, if I'm not accurate. I mean, they, they've got all the research that I've got at my disposal. And man, can they hold you accountable. So I, I became a slave to that for two months prior to shooting where I, I watched literally 200 plus hours of video, listened to as much audio as I could, read I was and, and uh, the Isaacson book and other material. And, um, you know, in terms of the distinct kind of things... His, his fingers, his voice and his fingers were the things that really kind of allowed me the in. Mm -hmm. He has this, it's interesting, he grew up in Northern California, but he almost has like a Midwestern sound to him. He does, yeah. Which I thought was a, a, a very kind of interesting, round sound. Um, so a lot of it was informed by, by that, and then, you know, like any performance, you do all this research and then you have to let it go and tell the story. Um, on a more uh, macro level, we had discussed early on about, you know, Wozniak being almost the Jiminy Cricket figure in this movie. The conscience. Really, yeah, that's really and, uh, He's and like I, the fool to Lear, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that it was an important, it was a very important choice because it, it allows you the um, emotional kind of uh, journey that you need in order to tell this story so that it's not just a black and white A&E biography of, you know, the events that occurred in Job's life. Right. Uh, you have to have some sort of kinesthetic response. And, and Josh really, you know, we sat down the first time and he was trying on auditioning the voice. He also, having come from theater, I mean, he brought a lot of it very small. He got kind of Waz's, he, Waz was very kind of all in here, you know. So Josh, so Josh really worked all of his stuff and he, he became very kind of, in, into the voice right there, you know, and that was a, that was sort of a big part of him keeping those all those idiosyncrasies, and then once the movie started, he really didn't have to, you know, you let it go, and then it's there. Right, right. Yeah, no, um, you know, I, I guess one word, one way you can describe Steve Jobs, I, I would say, is uh, enigmatic. I guess. Oh, that's the only way to describe uh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, a completely, yeah, he's a complete right. enigma. <laughs> Enigmatic, paradoxical. Yeah. Um, there, we know nothing. I don't care about any books out there. We really know nothing right, about right, it. So right. that makes right. it tough to kind of... Impossible. Yeah, to, to really get a, a handle on who, on who he is. I'm, I'm curious to kind of research, you know, that you guys put into... There was a lot of there was a lot of research put into it, and the but we were I was shackled as a director towards the things that we knew, and it wasn't very much. My hope is that this movie doesn't answer all the questions; that it sort of just gives a, a, a you know the combination and the accumulation of the scenes gives you a feeling of who the man was. You know everything that you, this is not a, this is a character who, who his own admission was brought up in a wonderful neighborhood, loved his step, his parents. He didn't have any drug addictions, wasn't abused. He was just a normal kind of guy. He didn't have those hallmarks of the biopics like a Johnny Cash where, you know, there's like those big sort of seminal moments of violence that informs the character. Even his adoption, he never admitted that he had anything but the normal curiosity of the adopted child. He never said, oh, you know, God, you know, people around him concluded that they thought that it was what drove him. But he himself, you know, he, he knew who his father was eventually. Never, he never actually could confront him. He used to wait for him and watch him outside. He, you know, he befriended and, and felt in that... His, his, his biological uh, sister, who they became great friends and loved each other. But, you know, there's very little we know about the wife. They were so fiercely private. So for us to do anything outside of what we showed would be total conjecture right. and also disrespectful in some way. You know, Josh and I have talked about historically, we will know more and more. Mm -hmm. What do you say this is like? Well, I say if you were to make a movie about... John F. Kennedy a year or two after his assassination it would be a very different movie than if you were to make that movie now. We just know so much more. Right. Over time, you learn so much more, for better or for worse, about a person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, John F. Kennedy, for all intents and purposes, was the Anthony Weiner of his generation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he was showing that thing to a lot of people. So there's, you know, but nobody knew that back then. Nobody knew that he was, you know, this Lothario. 
Um, Ironically, it's because the devices uh, that that's right. you created that's right. that, that yeah. allow us to know all that kind Exactly. Of stuff. And <laughs> so I think, but I do think that the man who created those devices was very aware and hypersensitive to not allowing himself to be uh, recorded. And, and so I think that he was an enormously, enormously private person. And I think that over time we might learn more. We, we still don't know the facts other than the closest we've come to it is the Isaacson book, which is told from his perspective, essentially. It's condoned by him. And he's telling us what he wants us to hear. But also the people in the Isaacson book who talk about him many times say, I worked with him for 30 years. I don't know if he knew I had a kid or a wife, meaning he would go to work with him. I mean, that's in that book. So the thing that's different between Kennedy even and Jobs, I think even when it all comes out, if it does through the family, because I really think, Loreen, I think the family's the only one who can really yeah. show? I don't think Waz has any more insight now. I don't think anybody to the true nature of him. He really is an enigma. And I think it goes to the fact that I think, for me, though Ashton may disagree or others might, he was a very unsentimental person. He didn't look back. He looked forward. But sentimentality implies connection. It means you have an emotional connection to something that happened in the past for which brings up memory and nostalgia. Friends are that way. Family are that way. You know, but for his friends, he didn't have that. And it wasn't that he had malice. It's just that they didn't fit into his world he that way. He didn't have the time for it. He, didn't. he was too busy creating tomorrow to worry about yesterday. And the other thing I think about when I think about Steve a lot, I, don't, I haven't spoken about this a lot, but it's when, if you've ever known someone who's found religion, they have an epiphany. And who they are on Wednesday before the epiphany is very different than they are the Monday once they've had it. They tend to be all and totally focused with their newfound baptism of whatever that is. And they usually tend to distance themselves from family who don't totally understand or agree with their new religion. And I think Steve was this guy wandering the world, and he found he had his epiphany. Mm -hmm. And once he had his epiphany, he became about the personal computer. And the movie's about him and the computer and the, and the company and how they started separate but then it sort of became the one, you know. Right. And I liked how you didn't make him this heroic figure that, you know, has no flaws and he's just the nicest guy ever, which would be completely against, <laughs> you know, what the Steve Jobs we know. But I mean, like in a lot of Hollywood biopics, I feel like, except for Walk the Line maybe, they kind of... Gloss over it. Exactly. And, yeah. and I like that you didn't... Mm -hmm. No, there's there's a lot of carnage in this movie. Right, there's right. There's a lot of carnage, because there was a lot of carnage in real life. Right. You know, I, I think that um, he did some questionable things to other human beings that I think a lot of people in the public eye still haven't forgiven him for. Um, at the same time, his contributions as an inventor are so immense that y you can't help but look at him and go, well, it was a means to an end, but it certainly that end paid off for right. all of us. Um, could he have done it without the shrewd nature? Perhaps. I don't think we'll ever know, but I think that he used it to his benefit and to our benefit in the long run because his decisions, as cruel as they may have seemed at the time, allowed him to create and help facilitate the invention of the iPhone, of the iPad, of the Apple TV, whatever that will look like, you know, his last great invention, right. apparently, that he talks about in the Isaacson book. So I think that there's a lot of that that is, you know, that's what makes him so fascinating to me. The, the thing that I think encapsulates him the best for me is the fact that a month or two after distancing himself with great venom and, and, and great conviction, uh, from his biological daughter, you know, right, yeah. we, based on DNA um, uh, evidence, he names a fucking device the Lisa <laughs> right. after his daughter that he wants nothing to do with. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about this person and how complicated telling a story about that person is, then, then I don't think you get it because it's like that's that's him. He was a man of unbelievable contradictions. Right. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Dean. Okay, well, I have a two-part question. Um, Josh, right here. I'd like to know what it's like, because I echo on Lauren's part that you cast people based on the look of the real-life people. I'd like to know, was it an easy process to do, or was it difficult, or did you have a right actor in mind to cast them for that role? 
I, I really wanted to cast the right people for the role. I did not have their physical <laughs> resemblance. It, it is uncanny, though, how much, like, Matthew Modine is, yeah. like, the scully. But you know what? It, yeah. it does, but that's kind of happenstance in the sense that... A- Ashton aside, because Ashton's look is so particularly Steve. And Steve was just a normal guy. It's not like you're doing that one character with that sort of idiosyncrasy or that one mole that defines him. Right. He was just a guy from Northern California who looked like a dude if you put in a young guy. So whoever plays him next, they're going to have to put, if they put a prosthetic on him and give him a, a new nose, it would look odd. So to me, that's separate. But for everybody else, I think it just, it was, it, it was, it was, did they feel the role? You know, I mean, Dermot Mulroney, nothing like, you know, the Mark Lowe. Mark Lowe was a very quiet, Drony, you know, like as uninteresting. These are <laughs> these guys were business guys in business parks. Right, right. They, you wouldn't want to have lunch with any of them. Right. Um, but the reality is, is that Dermot found his own into that character. Um, everyone found their own, you know, moment. They didn't have a lot of time on screen. So whether you're Chris Espinosa, you're the kid, or you're Daniel Cott, you're Lucas Haas, you're just kind of like the drifter. You know, I I just explained to all of them what was more important is that. That you find the heart of who they are and just be that and live in the moment of that character because if you can live in the moment you don't only have to be on screen for a very short amount of time and and um, there's some uniformly great performances there's some great in the movie oh that yeah Anna the girlfriend I mean everybody yeah. it's just wonderful and and this is a movie that lives and dies on the on the performance. It does it, that's 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 any movie, but it's a drama at heart. So you know, it, it's it's hopefully you know, and I'm I'm really proud of all of them, all the performances. And my second part goes to you, Josh. What was it like to work with the cast? I mean, it was unbelievable. I, a lot of these guys I grew up admiring the hell out of, whether it was um, Matthew from, you know, the Kubrick film, or um, whether it was Dermot and kind of growing up watching him. Uh, but the, the, the greatest surprise and payoff to me was Ashton. I mean, I just got to say, I've worked with some pretty impressive people, you know, in, in my career, and he was one of the most impressive in terms of his commitment to character and setting the tone for the rest of us to make sure that we matched what he was doing, what he was giving. Uh, and that was a pretty hard task on most days. How much of the old uh, Apple technology did you guys get to play with on set? <laughs> well, I mean, I, that's his... He, he, old technology as in uh, soldering a board. Yeah, that, literally. The, old, the, old, like, I the oldest technology. I had to take soldering and computer programming courses. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I Which, took soldering. So it's I insane. It's so Burned insane. myself like five times. <laughs> he um, was really good at it, though. He used to... Because I, I used to like the smoke that would come out of it dramatically. So he would actually find the smoke to actually inflect a line, you know. Well, Steve... <laughs> <laughs> I love that I became Sean Connery. Well, yeah, he was like, he'd, he'd have that. He'd go, well, Steve, turn to Steve, smoke, smoke on the lens. Perfect. And then when it, when it gets the smoke, he'd go, well, I'll do it again, I'll do it again. And he'd go, soldering acting. Oh, no, he's solder axe. Solder he's, acting. He, he has been soldering acting. acting I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a solder mic. <laughs> I think we're done here, guys. Thank but, uh, you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Actually, this is 